Okay, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome uh, everyone to our um, uh, seminar series on trustworthy data science and AI. Uh, today we are extremely honored and uh, pleased to have a Professor uh, Girard uh, Wickham to talk about uh, Knowledge Graphs 2022, Achievements, Challenges and Opportunities. And indeed, uh, Professor Wickham doesn't really need an introduction. As so many people already came to this seminar. This is a very um, strong evidence showing that. Um, but let me still give a, a short, uh, brief introduction on that. Um, Professor Wickham is a scientific director at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Informatics in uh, Saarbrücken, uh, Germany, and an adjunct professor at the same university. He co-authored a comprehensive textbook on transactional systems, received the VLDB Test of Time Award 2002 for his work on automatic database training. He is one of the creators of the uh, Yako uh, Knowledge Base, which was recognized by the World Wide Web Test of Time Award in 2018. Professor Wickham is an ACM fellow and elected member of uh, various academics. He received the uh, ACM Sigma Contributions Award in 2011, a Google focused research award in 2011, and ERC uh, grant in 2014. The ACM Sigma uh, Edgar Code uh, Innovation Award in 2016 and the uh, Corrade uh, Zeus uh, Medal in 2021. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Girard Wakem to give the talk. Thank you, Professor Wakem. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a pleasure at least to be virtually in Vancouver and uh, get into interaction with you. Uh, topic, knowledge graphs. So we will, it's a broad talk, a bit of an overview. We will look at achievements and state of the art a bit into the past, but the emphasis is here if uh, I can. Uh, right, okay. Emphasis is on open challenges and yeah. uh, research opportunities. Yeah. Obviously yeah. with uh, uh, some of our team's ongoing work, uh, in that last part. Uh, okay, so let me first give you a, a slightly different uh, story of my personal background. Um, I was academically raised in the area of database systems and worked in this field for 20 or 30 years. Um, I always appreciated the precise nature of the data in this field and the structure querying, and the two together would give you precise and concise answers to information needs, great asset. Uh, but the content at some point became boring to me. It was always about, about suppliers, parts, databases, inventory, and billing, uh, not super exciting. I found the web content way more exciting. And in general, I found web and, and actually improving the way we can uh, uh, query web content, uh, so fascinating and so challenging. Actually, this became my main area. At some point, a vision emerged. Can not we apply structure querying, precise querying to web contents? That is a priori, very vague and, uh, and noisy and highly ambiguous and spread across many sites. For example, can we answer queries like this, science fiction books turned into movies, or which hockey player had the most assists across all World Cups? Example answers, 2001, A Space Odyssey. This is a book which in the end became a movie. And the answer to the second question should be known to every uh, child in Canada. I won't give it to you. Um, so these would be easy to evaluate. Uh, towards crisp answers, if all the relevant information were in one structured curated database, but this is exactly not the web setting. Here we are 
the, the relevant information is a spread across many sites in highly diverse formats, including lists and also a lot of textual content. So it turns out uh, for us, um, like 15 years ago or so, and, and still valid today, this goal is too difficult to achieve in one single shot, right? So there's still no end-to-end -end method, an elegant unified method end-to-end -end which achieves this. Instead, we settled for an intermediate goal, namely to construct a knowledge base in a mostly automated way uh, from web sources, extracting knowledge from web sources and organize this knowledge base in terms of entities and relationships between them. And this way have a catalyst that can help search engines to perform these kinds of entity centric querying. So you already saw the book. Now this is my um, running example for some part of the talk, the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. More than 50 years old, a classic a science fiction movie. And it featured uh, very interesting characters. One is on the top, Hell 9000 is probably the first AI in the history of movies. And at the bottom, you see this uh, black monolith in the orbit of Jupiter. We time traveled back into the year 2001. The movie is actually even older. And in 2001, knowledge graphs were still science fiction. But search engines were already powerful. So given a keyword query, 2001 Odyssey Rider, we would get back 10 blue links to fairly high quality web pages, very informative, but not at first glance. So we would have to go to each of them, click, open, read, browse, go back and forth. And after a while, we would get uh, the answer that we're after, like who wrote that book that underlies the movie or who wrote the script for the movie, but it's time consuming and somewhat tedious. Now this has changed um, because today all the major search engines have large knowledge graphs as a background asset um, and transparently to the user who issues this query, they would try to map uh, words or phrases of the query onto entities and predicates of the knowledge graph. In this case onto the movie and the word writer is mapped to the predicate screenplay, the script writers. In this case, the answer, direct answer is Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. On the right-hand side, uh, the search engine often, not always, when this mapping works well, then they often show you on the right-hand side an excerpt of the knowledge graph about the movie. But when we click here, we get uh, the excerpt about Arthur C. Clarke. We can formulate full-fledged questions and have them crisply evaluated. Who wrote the score for 2001? Highly ambiguous in several ways. And we can also go after a whole set or class of entities by paraphrasing what we are after, science fiction books with aliens. We get a list, or they call this a knowledge carousel. We can browse left and right of high quality results. So now this was like the intro for the people who haven't heard uh, at all about knowledge graphs. Uh, you saw now a knowledge graph in action in the context of search engines, which is the prime uh, um, use case with the biggest uh, impact problem. But let's now go more systematically over these uh, achievements that led to this state of the art. And then I will identify challenges and elaborate on some challenges or subset uh, as far as uh, ongoing research opportunities are concerned. So a bit of history, um, facilitating computers with world knowledge is, a, is an old dream of AI. You can go back to uh, the 1950s. John McCarthy wrote essays about this um, epistemic uh, uh, dimension of AI. Um, but it took actually until the late 80s that we saw the first knowledge base of notable size. In the Psych project by Doug Lennett and his team, a small team of knowledge engineers modeled world knowledge by specifying logical axioms like these ones here. Uh, every human has a mother and a father, the mother is unique, and so on and so on. Millions of axioms. In parallel, these two people, Miller and Fellbaum, uh, 
linguists and cognitive scientists uh, built up WordNet, a lexicon, a large lexicon that systematically organizes English words and their senses, their meanings. For example, WordNet would know that the word player is ambiguous, has multiple senses, and one of them, in one of them, player has a synonym, musician. There's also modeling of specializations and generalizations. So there's kind of a class or concept hierarchy. Now, both of these pioneering projects have in common that they were inherently limited in scope and scale, simply because everything was handcrafted by small teams of humans. So that could not go super big. Then Wikipedia came along and that actually became a game changer. First, it scaled up. So now we had millions of contributors, so scale was no longer the showstopper. Of course, that came with a lot of noise and mixed quality in the early years, but after a few years, it stabilized, Wikipedia became mature. There was high quality content at large scale, all in one website and in a uniform uh, markup format, namely the Wiki markup language. Still, I would not call this a knowledge base, or knowledge graph uh, because it was meant for human consumption. So humans could read articles and follow links and inform themselves, but for the computer, for algorithms, this would largely be gibberish. And uh, for, it's not a, a knowledge base in the formal uh, representation sense. But this provided an opportunity around the mid 2000s, which some projects seized. And the opportunity was now to tap the high quality contents like Wikipedia, but maybe also other sources uh, in an algorithmic automated manner, identify key pieces of knowledge, distill them out and organize them in a formally represented knowledge base. Formally represented so that programmed applications could leverage it as opposed to humans reading things. Now, as um, Jan mentioned, Yago was our project. Freebase was commercial, got acquired by Google. And you already saw the knowledge graph, the Google knowledge graph by my search engine examples. There were other industrial players early on. Wolfram Alpha is a notable one, but maybe there were others. Um, the usual suspects here, the internet giants, they all joined uh, around this time. Uh, no judgment on who was first and so on. So around this time. Um, and to, today there's also knowledge graphs in industries outside IT. For example, Bloomberg uh, has a large knowledge graph team uh, in finance. Um, and there's also various uh, cases, uh, nice examples in the biomedical or health domain. The largest publicly available knowledge graph today is Wikidata. 100 million entities with more than a billion facts. Um, however, it's noteworthy the, the knowledge graphs that are in the back end of search engines are not directly accessible, but through search, they kick in occasionally. They are even larger, one or two orders of magnitude larger. This is how the knowledge in the knowledge base or knowledge graph, these two are roughly synonyms. Uh, Although industry prefers the knowledge graph jargon because they coined it, right? Um, so it's in represented in relational form. A lot of this is actually binary relations and then the graph uh, analogy actually fits well. Um, these instances of binary relations can be thought of as subject predicate object triples. Examples are instances of classes and uh, subclass superclass statements. Factual knowledge about the life and works of Arthur C. Clarke in my examples, all the way to expert knowledge here from the biomedical domain. Occasionally, we need to capture spatial, temporal, and other contexts to properly interpret uh, one of these triples. And this is actually an example of a higher arity relation. But of course, they are in the uh, world of semantic web uh, formats. There are syntactic uh, tricks to cast it into triples, into a set of triples. So syntactically, you can still think of it as a graph, but the actual semantic interpretation is higher arity relations. This slide illustrates how we construct the knowledge graph. 
um, in an automatic manner from web content. Uh, humans place digital traces, uh, pieces of their knowledge onto the internet in the form of data collections, lists, tables, text articles like scientific publications, books, essays, news, all the way to social media conversations. And what algorithms can do, they can dig into this content, identify the highest quality sources, and within these identify what I would think of as the key pieces or cornerstones of a knowledge base, namely the individual entities, like people, places, organizations, products, creative works, uh, specific events, and so on. And uh, once we have them pinpointed, we can distill them out and start populating a knowledge base. We organize entities into semantic types, which you've seen before. And if the algorithms are good, they can also infer, at least sometimes, relationships between entities. Here, Kubrick and Clark wrote the script for the movie. Clark wrote the book that was turned into the movie. Kubrick was the director, and so on. Now, once we have such a core of, uh, of a knowledge uh, base, this helps algorithms, in turn, to interpret the a priori uh, noisy, wake, and ambiguous web content. And we can iterate this process to acquire more knowledge, deeper knowledge, and better knowledge. Obviously, this is a bird eyes view, right? So the, there's lots of technical details to get this going. The heart of this machinery is the actual information extraction or knowledge extraction, fact extraction, relation extraction uh, methods, or different names for this. Um, there's no time in this talk, nor any point in going into any depth here. But let me point out that uh, it's, it's not the case that there is a single unified method that does the whole job end to end. Uh, there's a variety of paradigms at work, and often you need to combine several to, to get the mileage. Uh, these include pattern matching and rule-based inference, so there's some hand modeling involved. Uh, learning patterns from examples, distance supervision, or fully trained deep neural networks uh, help a lot in some cases, and all the way to probabilistic logical reasoning over consistency constraints, which is often crucial for quality assurance, pruning out false positives, and uh, which in turn is uh, crucial for the long-term maintenance or creation of a knowledge graph. Major use cases include semantic search and question answering, which in turn is part of the broad theme of natural language understanding. Knowledge graphs are often leveraged as a source of distance supervision for a variety of downstream machine learning. Knowledge graphs are rich repositories of entities, which is important for text analytics. Think of sentiment mining about products or politicians, for example. Uh, knowledge graph embeddings are strong building blocks to be combined with other uh, building blocks, like other kinds of machine learning, other embeddings for other data modalities. Uh, there's usage and data cleaning and so on. In addition to broad coverage of entities and facts with maybe an emphasis on entertainment and business relevant uh, entities, uh, there are vertical domain knowledge graphs, particularly in the areas of health, food, finance, and there's more. So much for the success story. By the way, if there are questions, please feel free to interrupt me. In my view, I cannot see the chat though. So then someone needs to tell me important question or so, right? Uh, otherwise I will move on. So let's now talk about the, the weaker points, the limitations, the open challenges. And there's quite a few actually, despite the big success story, uh, as we move the, the bar higher, we become more uh, ambitious in our goals. And in the following, I offer you a very subjective choice of three challenges. And then in the la last and longest part of the talk, I will drill down into two of the three and discuss uh, into a bit more depth uh, specific research opportunities. 
So this is my challenge one, the actual coverage of the knowledge base, not precision, not high, not quality of what we have, but do we have everything we want to have in a knowledge graph? In particular, everything that humans um, would like to know if they want to obtain actual knowledge from a knowledge graph. This is the Wikipedia page about Arthur C. Clarke, but knowledge graphs by and large focus on what is in these info boxes. They may not extract directly from info boxes, but info boxes are typically the, the, the pieces that are extractable with highest quality. And then once you have some of these, you use them for distance supervision. So this is the focus. And also they follow the Wikipedia hypothesis that this is the primary information and everything else would be secondary. But when you look more carefully, it's just very basic. It's about biography, it's major awards, uh, major tra training, where did he uh, get his degrees and, and awards and major works, right? So it pretty much ends here. But this page is super informative, super rich, it goes on and on. And there's so much more interesting that humans would find noteworthy about this person. For example, Clark moved to Sri Lanka and lived there uh, for quite a long time because of his hobby, scuba diving. He was nominated for the Peace Nobel Prize. An asteroid was named after him. He was a commentator for, recognize the date, the moon landing, uh, first moon landing. Apollo 11, and so on. Second example, um, uh, it's not just this um, insufficient coverage about uh, people, but here we look at, uh, at an example from the realm of creative works, the book 2001. Here it's even more basic, author, cover artist, language, publisher, and then further down we have such thrilling facts as number of pages in the US edition versus number of pages in the UK edition. Nice to have this complete and it boosts your, your number. So largest knowledge base ever and so on. But I doubt that anybody, any, any user, any human is really interested in, in such details. What's more interesting is the content and the story, the background story of the book. It's based on a short story that Clark wrote um, already in the early 50s. Um, it features interesting locations, interesting characters, one being an AI, another being an alien artifact, and so on. So the research challenge here is twofold. Um, on one hand, we, we need to, to um, get a hold on long tail entities and also long tail types. Alien artifact is a non-standard type. And the relations or predicates of interest are also very non-standard. Uh, named after, nominated for an award, not winning the award, nominated, features location, features character, and so on. Um, th this challenge has two, two flavors. One is because of long tail and non-standard nature, um, they would be infrequently mentioned in internet sources, like in text collections, uh, as opposed to the author of a book, which the book author pair would be often more frequent. Uh, that makes it hard for unsupervised or weakly supervised methods to identify and extract this kind of knowledge. At the same time, and for the same reason, long tail, non-standard, and not in info boxes, there are no, or at best few training samples so distant supervision and or fully supervised methods don't work easily either. So far, nobody has found the right handle here. Second uh, limitation or gap is uh, common sense knowledge, what uh, every child already knows. For example, every child knows that mountains can be high, steep, or rocky, but they are not fast, furious, or funny. Properties of objects, of everyday common objects. Uh, usage of, of tools, causality, activities of individual people, of social groups, emotions, positive, negative, and so on. Um, now, it's hard for computers to acquire this because these things are so common, so mundane, that they are rarely mentioned explicitly. Even when in some kind of sources, when they are mentioned explicitly, like in social media, 
there's a big bias. There's often a tendency towards exceptional cases or even sensational cases. And let me illustrate this last point, this, this reporting bias is a big issue here. Suppose we want to figure out the typical color of an elephant from internet statistics. And I have a very primitive, very simplistic way of doing this. I generate different candidates like gray elephant, brown elephant, white elephant, and so on. And then I run these through a search engine and look at the estimated headcount. And the winner is the pink elephant because of Walt Disney's pink elephant grade in the movie Dumbo. So the challenge is to acquire typical and salient common sense knowledge, avoid the, the exceptional, sensational, or uh, out of context uh, cases. But that means you have to cope with a huge amount of noise, bias, and nonsense because of the nature of the sources. We're no longer tabbing Wikipedia here. Wikipedia is not the right source for this kind of common sense knowledge. Now there is, a, over the years, uh, there has always been some projects um, in this area. There, there is nice advances, steady advances, but no breakthrough in sight. The third um, issue here, third gap, is what I call quantity knowledge. We want to support also knowledge workers, such as analysts, journalists, or data scientists. And these people often have tasks where they want to uh, analyze a group of entities or several groups of entities, um, which they construct by filtering and, and grouping. Um, and then they want to compare entities within a group or across groups. And this involves often quantitative properties of entities and aggregation, like averaging, looking at max summation and so on. Examples. Marathon runners with the most races under two hours, 10 minutes, cars with energy efficiency below a certain threshold, AI startups with venture capital above a certain threshold, uh, and so on. Now, again, this would be easy if we had a single database with all the relevant content, which is not there, not anywhere, not for queries of that more sophisticated nature. Knowledge graphs don't help either. This is Wikidata statistics, recent. So they're rich in terms of the relevant entities, but they're super sparse, if not empty, on the quantities. Thousands of marathon runners and only a dozen has their best racing time. Not to speak of sufficiently many so that we can evaluate the first query. Challenge is to augment a Nash graph with a rich set of quantitative properties, and this way, um, help search engines to move up in the value chain and provide at least supporting building blocks towards analytic queries. Now, unless there are questions, I want to drill down into two of these three challenges. The first one, coverage, and the last one, quantities. Uh, and obviously I picked these because my group has ongoing research in, on these topics and I will give you a feel uh, for what we're doing and what the interesting issues are and what the open issues are. So first about the knowledge coverage, and we'll see that uh, so-called language models uh, are a potential asset here. Basic facts from info boxes and lists and other high quality sources, this is, this is fine. We, we know how to do this, it's no longer the challenge. But if we want to go for salient facts on long tail entities or non-standard predicates, we have to bite the bullet. We have to go into noisier content like uh, text articles and be even beyond Wikipedia. This is not new. Uh, it's actually the theme of extraction, information extraction from text is older than the whole knowledge graph theme, right? It goes back to the MAC conference 20, 30 years ago. Uh, message understanding content uh, conference, this was Mark. But it seems to me, the, despite nice advances once in a while, that uh, this is stagnating. And uh, information extraction from text rarely gets above 80% precision, which sounds good on your leaderboard and in your publications, but actually in the knowledge base uh, context, it's, it's a disaster. 80% good means 20% bad. 
Out of a billion facts, that means we have 200 million incorrect statements in a knowledge graph. There's no hope to hire crowdsourcing workers or other humans or, or, or buy some magic bullet to, to fix that level of, of incorrect knowledge. So what are the thoughts then? What could be explored? So open information extraction is a nice paradigm which produces structured output, but the constituents of the tuples in the output are surface names or phrases. And they are not canonicalized. So diff different phrases can denote the same predicate, but you wouldn't know. So you need post-processing and there's no really high quality methodology for this that would deliver 90% or 95% uh, correct outputs. So OpenAI is good for recall actually, but not good for precision. Neural um, networks uh, have had great success, but mostly in the realm of on the left side, basic facts where you have ample of uh, samples for distance supervision. If you go for non-standard predicates, you, you don't have any samples up front or only very few. So facing a zero shot or a few shot learning problem, uh, nobody knows how to deal with this. And the last hope is language models, which is a concept that revolutionized the whole NLP field. We'll take a look at this because in my thinking, it's the most promising among, at least among the three that I listed. Um, so, I call them neural language models and the word language model is, is very old. So LSI and LDA and so on were also language models or latent topic models, but not based on neural learning. The, this newer generation of language models is essentially based on huge neural networks with hundreds of billions of parameters like Palm, the latest, uh, Language model from Google has like half a trillion parameters, if I recall correctly. These networks are self-trained over huge text corpora, all of Wikipedia, thousands if not millions of books, huge news archives, um, scientific articles, let's say all of PubMed on biomedicine, whatever is there. Um, and the training objective is to generate or predict pieces of text that are masked out. This could be individual words like in bird, for example, or entire phrases, or even complete sentences or passages like in a conversational setting. The way this self-training works is by digging into these uh, large text collections that uh, the providers of these big language models have at their disposal. Look at the bottom line. So we have sentences such as evidence for the expansion of the universe was discovered by Lemaitre and Hubble. These big text collections are full of knowledge intensive sentences. We masked out one piece, let's say the phrase Lemaitre and Hubble, and then we have the remainder with the mask, the question mark. And that means we have a training pair. We have the input, for the network with the mask, and we already have the correct output, the crown truth output, because we took it from the original text. And we can do this at the scale of millions and billions without having to annotate any single piece of text. Very elegant, and it turns out super powerful. So the trained network can now make contextual predictions or text generation. So-and-so was the first to observe Jupiter's moon Europa. Correct prediction is the top ranked one, Galilei, Galilei, uh, Galileo Galilei. Uh, there are more predictions and these are incorrect. And in parentheses, you see the system produced confidence scores. So ideally you get the top ranked uh, prediction or text generation as the correct one. Now this is so powerful, it has revolutionized NLP. Uh, in the big NLP conferences these days, there's virtually maybe 1% of the papers, and we're talking 500 or more papers every year. 1% uh, of the papers does not make use of language models. All aspects of text understanding and also text generation. It has even been leveraged nicely in domains outside of NLP. So here's an example, it's not my own work, uh, it's about entity matching. So this is in the database world. 
there's also usage for entity linking related but slightly different, but this slide focuses on entity matching. We're given two tables independently crafted. So it can be from a data lake of different databases. Uh, and we're trying to figure out which of the records left correspond to which of the records right, correspond in the sense of denoting the same or referring to the same real world entity. Um, the way this works is amazingly simple. So we look at what each of these records and we verbalize them into token sequences. That means we go cell by cell, left to right, and, and, and just treat every token that we spot there as if it were a new word. We interleave this with the tokens in the column headers because they are often uh, informative. And then we have a token sequence, which is just like text. And we can run this through the language model um, to encode this, latently encode it. It's kind of contextualizing the records, adding background information in a latent manner. And that background information is everything or includes everything that Wikipedia would know. For example, if these are customer databases or product databases, then there's location information or product types. And Wikipedia is in particular, but other sources are um, contribute as well. It's so rich. This is a super rich contextualization. And now it's much easier for machine learning to, to compute the proper matches. We can add, if available, additional background knowledge, like types of entities, if there are entities uh, in these token sequences. And then we put one or more additional layers on top to train a classifier that takes two records, left and right as input, and decides whether they are the same or not. Very elegant. Of course, again, I'm simplifying a little here, but, um, but the simplicity is the strength and the power comes from this neural contextualization by the language models, having latently remembered or latently relearned everything they have seen in the training collection. Now, this is so, so powerful and so impressive that uh, the, the hypothesis came up, maybe language models are knowledge graphs. Maybe we don't need explicit knowledge graphs, latent knowledge is good enough because the language models can easily be combined with other components, like layering um, more machine learning on top uh, and it becomes a big transformer or similar neural network architecture. And indeed, this goes a long way, as again, you see uh, two examples for the success, but there are also some, some doubts um, to be considered. And some of the doubts, I think, are so strong that I actually call them showstoppers. These are not meant, this is not a universal critique. They are not meant to be showstoppers forever. On the contrary, they should guide the next step research. Uh, but for the time being, I don't think anybody in the world has an answer to these issues. So this is why I call them showstoppers. Here's the first one. This notion of prediction confidence that you saw is very treacherous. Consider this query now with the, this masked uh, prompt to the language model, Jupiter's moons are. There are more than 80 moons uh, around Jupiter. Um, and you see the, some of the uh, predicted results um, from, I think, GPT-3 in this case. Some high confidence uh, predictions are just wrong, plain wrong. And uh, the first correct ones, IO and Europa, have relatively low scores. So should we go after these? Should we take them, even though their scores are so low? Even worse, suppose we want to find, let's say, half of the moons which would be around 40, maybe, and then we have to go very deep into the ranked list, maybe to rank 500. And then at, at this rank uh, 500, we can give back to the user 40 or to the application, programmed application, 40 correct Jupiter moons, but they are accompanied by 460 false positives. So this doesn't make sense, right? We cannot use this. This is the opposite example, uh, which was the first woman stepping on the moon. The only correct answer is the empty set. 
But language models have a hard time understanding the concept of an empty set, of abstaining from predicting something. Likewise, a related issue is not understanding negations. Uh, so they would always predict you something, Sally Wright, at least an astronaut, but never made it to the moon. Luna, the moon goddess, Wonder Woman, the language model is hallucinating. So this is an issue. We don't know how to cope with these, uh, these confidence scores and the actual rankings, especially when we want to arrive at lists of answers, not a single answer like birthplace of, uh, of Newton and so on, this would be easier. Second showstopper has to do with the knowledge base life cycle. We don't want to construct it once, use it for a month and write some nice papers and get to the top of a leaderboard. We want to maintain it. We want to use it for production level uh, mission critical applications over years, if not decades. And for that, we need to continuously maintain it. That's an issue. Um, consider this um, example, who won this year's Turing Award? The answer is Jack Dongera. Uh, language model, again, GPT-3 predicts uh, previous Turing laureates uh, dating back a few years. Not bad, but all wrong. And the confidence scores are meaningless. So wrong is wrong, no matter how confident you are. To be fair, the language model has no chance to get this right because it was last trained in December 2021. But now we would like to update it. So an update should be incremental. So we would like to give it, let's say, 100 uh, recent articles about uh, important awards about, or about computer science, and then it would um, adjust itself in a lightweight, efficient manner. There's no way to do this today. So we would have to retrain it from scratch. We can en enhance, uh, add documents to the text collection, the training collection, and then we have to rerun the entire heavy duty machinery. A variation is this one, last year's Turing Award winner, which would be Aho and Ullman. Um, again, old results or Turing would win his own award. It's a silly answer, but this is what it is. Now, this could have gotten right by the language model, um, but it uh, fails here. So now we would like to do troubleshooting. We would like to, to pinpoint the, 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 the root cause of this error and fix it um, in a minimally invasive manner, which is something we can do with an explicit knowledge graph. But now by that latent nature, Nobody knows how to do this. The state-of-the-art solution is to retrain, add a few documents or change something in the training collection and retrain the whole thing with the heavy duty machinery. And even then we have no guarantee that this error does not reappear again. So there's huge potential in, in looking at uh, language models, not as a substitute for knowledge graphs. I don't think it this way but as a complement, of course, it can support knowledge graph construction and maybe also knowledge graph curation, but we need more research to arrive at robust solutions. Any questions so far? I'm a little slower than I thought I would be. I hope this is not a problem. Um, hi, uh, just a quick one, I guess. So, so for the previous, uh, the example on the previous slide, uh, would, would the system typically be able to understand, for example, really if I ask uh, who won the um, Turing Award last year instead of saying 2021, is there kind of a translation? No, no, that? that doesn't help. That doesn't help. You, oh. the, the, of course, if you play with this uh, three hours and try out oh. 50, uh, reformulations, some of them are lucky, but that this is so critical to get the formulation exactly into the sweet spot realm of the language model is already telling. So okay. it's not robust on this. Okay. But last year does not work, on, okay. I think even on the contrary. I played with these examples quite a bit. Mm. Okay, thank you. There's uh, some, someone raised the, the virtual hand, the Zoom hand. Yes, hi, This is my name is Daniel. Uh, great presentation, I really like the uh, the overview of the knowledge um, networks, but 
there's no discussion of explainable AI or AI that can explain its answer as to why it chose something. It seems to me that would be a first step toward um, better answers. For example, uh, it would certainly help improve the, mm, the um, percentage that's used to think about how correct the answer is, if it can explain why. And I don't think uh, the, the knowledge grasped by themselves can answer that they're, they're sort of a parrot type of functionality, but something that can then use more uh, or provide evidence can improve the percentage. What do you think about that? It's a great uh, point. Uh, explainability would also list high on my uh, uh, set of open challenges. I, just for the purpose of this talk, it's not on my agenda. Um, now, indeed, this is especially a tough one with language models. Of course, they could try to find an, a, a text passage which serves as a piece of evidence, uh, but it would still rely on, on the, the latent uh, neural inference of the language model. The explicit knowledge graphs have a better chance. They, I'm not saying that they can do this super well, but they have a better chance because they can have more explicit provenance of where some fact come to, has been spotted, where was it extracted from, and this could be multiple pieces of evidence or provenance, if you think so. Uh, they can also, they have a better position to reason about things. Uh, so it's, it is a mega issue overall, absolutely true. Uh, and, and, it's, and it would also be a current showstopper here on language models. Thanks for raising this. Okay, so then let's move on to the last part, which is uh, this theme of entities with quantities supporting knowledge workers, at least with building blocks for analytic tasks. We'll look at two cases, extracting what I call quantity facts from text and also extracting from web tables. And this is where we have uh, some ongoing research for a couple of years, and so I mostly refer to our own research, but I will point out open issues. So we haven't, it's far from being solved completely. Um, remember the kind of queries I gave you earlier. Now in this part, we will settle for a simplified version. So we had queries that involve group by runners with at least 10 marathons under a certain time. We're simply trying here to the kind of queries which have filter conditions on quantities, but no grouping. So that would be runners with a marathon under two hours 10, musicians worth more than 100 million euros, hybrid cars with electric range above 50 kilometers, things of that nature. It turns out they're difficult enough. So in this setting, what I mean by quantity is a, is a tuple which, um, has a numerical value, a unit, which can be simple, such as feet, meter, and so on, or complex, such as kilowatt hours per kilometer, uh, or the very sophisticated unit, for example, for thermal uh, conductivity, thermal conductivity, heat conductivity, and so on. And there's often a notion of a context to properly interpret the quantity like uh, musicians worth uh, might have actually might need a date uh, referring to past or versus as of today or revenue of companies definitely needs a time frame. Hybrid cars with battery range here, the word battery is really instrumental uh, because the full range for hybrid car is very different from its electric range. It's important to differentiate these queries from what I call quantity lookups, where we start with an entity, for example, Eliud Kipchoge, a marathon runner, and we just look up the quantity uh, in either in a knowledge graph, if available, but often it's not available, or we leverage search engines. In fact, search engines do a decent job on this, uh, at least if it involves uh, prominent entities. Let's see uh, how search engines actually perform. So what is JC worth? Uh, a direct answer can't do much better than this. But this is a lookup. This is the easy case. 
wrapper is worth more than $200 million. This is now a filter condition, a filter query. And we are back to 10 blue links and not even super exciting ones. So you have to read a lot and spend a lot of time to compile a list of the richest wrappers uh, or all wrappers above uh, that threshold that I gave. Uh, a little disclaimer, I'm not really keen on rap music. Turns out once you search for rich musicians, they are unavoidable. They are really the, the, at the very top of the, the money pyramid uh, for whatever reasons. So we built a prototype system called QSearch, um, which uh, handles these uh, kind of queries to some extent. It's prototypical, of course, it has many uh, weak points as well. And it's based on extraction from text. This is the first case. What we do is we decompose the query, and here we can also handle full-fledged questions. So we identify the target type, entities of what kind do we want to get back, wrappers. Then there is a quantity condition and the comparison operator, larger than in this case, and uh, informative cues that capture the relevant context. In this case, the word worth is important. We get back such results. These, these are high confidence results. Uh, for example, 50 Cent. Uh, 50 Cent is the name. And interestingly, in this world of rap music, 50 Cent is worth more than $150 million. You see, we do currency conver unit conversions here, currencies. And in Cray, you also see the, the different context cues we spot in, in, in in text and capture as the context of these quantity facts for comparison against what the query is, what the information intent is. The approach in a nutshell has two stages. Offline, we extract quantity facts from web text. Uh, the facts are then represented in this way. There is the entity, there's the quantity with the units inferred, uh, sometimes easy, sometimes a difficulty by itself. And then we have a, a, a set of uh, phrases, actually, which are the contextual cues, which we think are relevant for comparison against queries. And then at query time, we, we match these candidate cue facts against the query representation, straightforward for the entity type check and the quantity comparison. Uh, but it's difficult for the context matching. And here we use information retrieval techniques, again, building on language models with embeddings, because we want to capture semantic relatedness, in, in, at least in a latent way. We, it's, we want to go beyond just surface uh, string matching. This is the second prototype system that we've built called Qt, and this taps into tables. The web is full of ad hoc tables. Um, there are 100 millions of tables embedded into HTML web pages, usually small tables, but highly informative. And when you go beyond these, um, like you look in, in more structured data, uh, but ad hoc, still ad hoc data on, on the internet, and also in cloud storage, you, you stumble upon spreadsheets, JSON files, tables, and so-called data lakes. And this is much larger even than these hundred millions of HTML tables. So here I ch I'm changing my application domain because this works better with sports. So here we're looking at footballers, European football, soccer, uh, who transferred for more than 50 million. And now we get the, the Q facts from, from table rows in context. So uh, the color coding, look at Neymar as a result. The color coding is the different candidate cues for the context representation of a cue fact. This includes in particular column headers. This is no uh, big surprise. And you also see that fee is a good match for transfer. This comes from the latent embedding. So we capture the relatedness, although there is no surface string match. Other cues are the same row uh, cells, uh, the surrounding text uh, to some extent, and the DOM tree path. If you parse the, the HTML, or it's even simpler in a JSON file, for example, 
Uh, there's the path of, of headings uh, and, and associated labels that leads from the page root or the JSON root to the respective table row. And this includes often very informative cues. We, they, they are differently weighted. We are hyperparameters, which we can train. Um, so let's now drill down a bit more into extracting from web tables. Um, it's not new. There's a very strong work by Sunita Saravagi and also by Alon Halevi and their teams. But this dates back roughly 10 years. And uh, surprisingly, they have faced their works out and there wasn't so much, a bit of work here and there, but nothing strategic in the past 10 years. So our theme here is to revive that, that problem setting and advance the state of the art further. Now, when you look at this table, I gave you a minute to look at it. You might think, ah, I know why there was no more recent work because the problem is solved, it's easy. So what should be difficult in terms of extracting uh, facts that relate entities and quantities from a table like this? It's all there, it's so explicit, so obvious. Um, it's still not easy. Um, and in addition, this is the benign case. This is the most friendly case that you can happen to encounter, but often it's harder. And this is a list of problems that makes it harder. One is that we not always have these nicely informative, almost self-explanatory headers. This is another situation where we have generic uninformative headers like name, head, site, size, value. Of course, humans can still interpret the table for various, because they look at the table in context, the surrounding text or a description of a, of a data file. Uh, and they also have a lot of background knowledge, right? Uh, which uh, a machine upfront when it sees this table doesn't have. So, and these generic headers uh, raise a second issue. It's often unclear which quantity column refers to which entity column. Is size a property of site, the stadium, or a property of name, the football team? Of course, there are many easy tables with a single entity column and two quantity columns. These are fine, but we want to have richer coverage, so we need to bite the bullet and also deal with these more sophisticated tables. Here we have three different entity columns. Value could also refer to head or to name or even to site. Another issue is the values themselves, the numeric values. So here they are all in the same format, but that's not uh, really the case uh, always, not even in Wikipedia. We often have missing values, not applicable, estimated, uh, truncated, approximate values. And so this, this is uh, not easy to spot everything properly and, and, and to renormalize uh, the values. Uh, and they can sometimes be arbitrarily inconsistent even within a single column of a single table. For example, here the header specifies uh, one unit, euros, and a scaling factor, billion. But the, at least one of the cells actually uses a different scaling factor, million, and a different currency, British pounds, right? And these cases do happen. Now I want to drill down another time into a sub-sub problem. Maybe it's not uh, your, uh, the most exciting problem, but it gives you a flavor for how we are dealing with this whole problem space. And this is this column alignment problem, um, which is also not new. So that prior work on web tables in general has looked into this issue as well. There are uh, well-established heuristics. One is leftmost entity column. But then size would be linked, aligned with to aligned to uh, name the football team, which is incorrect. There's a different heuristics closest left, but then value would be linked to site, the stadium, which is incorrect. So there's no single heuristics which really works robustly. Uh, classifiers are actually the state of the art with a bit of training data, handcrafted training data. Uh, but state of the art achieves like 80% uh, precision. And we would like to do better. And, this, and remember also, this is just a sub-sub problem. If the entity, if the column alignment is wrong, 
then everything else goes wrong as well, right? So we're producing a lot of downstream errors in, in larger scale extraction. There's some fancier methods, sophisticated methods, which try to mine uh, functional dependencies uh, within the data. And then based on entropy measures, conditional entropy and the like, in, infer the, the most likely uh, alignment between columns. But look at the data here. It's all unique values. So uh, none of these uh, cell values has frequency higher than one. So all the entropy measures are totally degenerated. This doesn't help you at all. And this is not an, a, an exceptional uh, situation. Many of these tables are relatively small. They are handcrafted in an ad hoc manner. They are meant, again, for humans to study something. And so it's, it's, it's often the case that all the values are pairwise uh, distinct. This is our solution in a nutshell. So the, the main point and the, the point to remember is that we leverage that we also have expertise on dealing with text. We actually extract from tables for the highest coverage, but we leverage text as a source of evidence or counter evidence. Think of this as a corroboration step. We pick one candidate alignment, and then we look at the value pairs in these two columns an entity and a quantity. And now we search large text corpora. So we have some reasonably large text corpora, uh, including news collections. And we try to spot uh, both entity value and quantity value in a, in a compact uh, proximity window, and taking this as good evidence that this indeed makes sense. This alignment makes sense. But we need to relax the entity matching and the quantity matching entity matching because we can spot just short names, uh, alias names, right? Um, which entails that we pick up the occasional false positive. In the last line here, Santiago Bernabeu is actually a person, not a stadium. The stadium is named after him. Uh, as far as the quantity values are concerned, we also need to relax and make this um, an approximate matching. Uh, because often these, these numbers are rounded, truncated, or maybe they refer to the number of uh, people in the stadium for a specific match. Many matches are close to being sold out, so it's close to the capacity, but it's not the capacity per se. If the quantity involves units, we have to make sure that we match a compatible unit. So if the table has, let's say, meters for some quantity, then it's good to match feet or inches or centimeters, but kilowatt would be uh, not a good match. Now, the better we can match this, and there is some machine learning involved and some scoring, of course, um, the more we think this is a correct alignment. And indeed, this whole approach allows us to uh, get uh, precision well above 90% for this column alignment problem. Where do we stand on this? Um, our work, I think, is good enough for search, at least at the prototypical level. Um, but it's not good enough for knowledge base augmentation at large scale. Search is a forgiving application, right? Ordinary users look at top 10 analysts, might browse a bit, maybe top 50, top 100. But even they don't look manually at top 10,000, right? They would need top 10,000 for another aggregation step. Uh, and we're not there. The, our methodology is not strong enough to get like uh, thousands of uh, marathon runners with their racing times from these kinds of sources. Um, the idea of leveraging multiple data modalities here, text and tables together is good for corroboration, evidence, counter evidence, scoring. Uh, but it could be pushed much further, I believe, into a full-blown knowledge fusion over different kinds of data modalities. But we haven't tried this. This would be future work. Um, we are focused on filter queries for the time being, because this is already hard enough. You can already do interesting research on this. Next step would be to support indeed uh, grouping in particular. Uh, but here again, high confidence results are not sufficient. You also need high recall. For example, 
women with five or more marathons under two hours, 25 minutes. If we have a short list with high confidence where we have 10 women and each was two races, we still don't know what to produce as output. Maybe they have more races that we couldn't capture right. And therefore, we cannot give you a good list. Uh, so we need higher recall. This is a showstopper here for the time being. So this brings me to the end. Um, what should you take home? Nosh graphs have become super powerful. They are uh, um, really strong assets for search engines and other applications. Um, and knowledge graphs, or you can say machine knowledge and machine learning, they are not alternatives or in any contrastive tension to each other. On the contrary, they are complementary, mutually supporting each other. The more a computer knows, the better it can learn. Knowledge graphs are indeed often used for distance supervision in machine learning. Um, and the better the computer learns, the more knowledge it can acquire. I, um, pointed out three challenges, the coverage, especially regarding long tail and non-standard statements, common sense, which every child already has, and supporting analysts with quantity knowledge and explainability, as someone pointed out earlier, could obviously be a big fourth issue, but there's probably even more than just these three or four, right? Uh, this talk cannot be complete. And I elaborated on two of these, pointing out some bits and pieces of technical work and opportunities. So everybody feel free to jump on some of these problems. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, so um, now we are open to uh, questions. Uh, anyone, if you have questions, please uh, just um, unmute yourself and speak out, or you can type your question in the chat area. Hi, Juan, please. Yeah, and uh, yeah, huh? great talk and a lot of information. I also noticed you worked at MCC. Yes, yeah, a long time oh. ago. But I was not in the psych project. The psych oh. project actually was at MCC. I was not involved in psych. Oh, okay. I worked, I worked on, a, on another uh, science fiction project, the Baba Parallel Database Machine. I see. So super exciting and a big failure in terms of immediate impact, long-term impact, yes. Like, like well, psych had impact. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. So was that your first job or? As a postdoc, yes. Oh, was, over there, I see. Postdoc at MCC in Austin. I see, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any, Oliver? Yeah, maybe just a clarification question on this. Uh, you know, you made these powerful examples uh, about how the system is confident about the wrong thing. Um, so machine learning, there's this notion of calibration that your confidence scores should match um, the actual accuracies. Um, <clears throat> so if I were to paraphrase your point as saying, oh, we need the language models to be calibrated, would, would that be an adequate paraphrase or is it is, is your point different? Uh, it would help in some cases because then at least we could say, well, confidence above 50%, likely high, but it does not go all the way. In particular for these list question needs, it doesn't work so well because it's not just the top answer. So if, if we know there's exactly one answer, right? A, fact, a factory question. Mm -hmm. Knowledge need is can be seen as a single fact uh, uh, demand, a single fact question. Uh, then it might help a little. It um, still is not so easy. You, you need the calibration would need some external crown tools. Uh, these these things can be normalized and so on, but they are not. Calibration is more than just normalization, right? Mm. And, the, and the crown and and the calibration would often hinge critically on the type of entities, the type of the questions and so on, um, because the language models do better on some things than on other things and so on. But the, the main point is really that these list questions are uh, not nearly uh, understood. Uh, 
80 moons of Jupiter. So what do these scores tell us? And then also there's the empty set questions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Um, the language model would have to learn to say no. Uh, GPT-3 sometimes says, I don't know, but it's not clear to me for what reasons. They might also have added some conservatism to avoid uh, um, swampy terrain, on, because obviously once these things are out, people try to game it all the time. Right? Yeah, thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. Any uh, further questions? Yeah, okay, right. uh, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is um, Do you see any, uh, most of the uh, knowledge graphs are about uh, facts. Uh, do you see any? Uh, place that the, uh, some subjective information may be uh, useful or, uh, for the knowledge graph. For example, for some questions, maybe the answers to uh, different people may be different. And yes. if we have some background yeah. knowledge about the, uh, about the um, you know, uh, users, um, then we may have to go with different uh, answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. In fact, we have a little project on personal knowledge basis. Mm -hmm would be like your personal profile of what you're interested in, uh, which could be used for personalization, personalized services, including personalization and chatbots, for example, mm -hmm. but with more explicit user control. So oh. you can selectively say this piece of knowledge, let it work out in this setting and for a different setting, let's use another one and they can more explicitly uh, uh, enable, disable, or update things. Hence, personal knowledge base, as opposed to a, just a profile. Uh, now, the, the big opponent here are the, the usual personalization profiles that especially the big companies have. They are semi-explicit, I would say. Um, like, uh, actually, this would be a... a a nice talk, which I also have, but it's a different topic. Uh, so I played with my Google app settings, for example, and it has 150 labels. In this case, it's labels, but some of the labels are almost facts. So they would know that I own a house. They would know my age, roughly. They, so there's a label between 55 and 65 years old. There's a label married and so on, children. Uh, and And... To be fair, Google allows you to check uncheck these things. So you can uncheck selectively. So, but of course they have a learning machinery that keeps learning, right? So if I uncheck now, maybe it, it, uh, it will relearn the same silly things. Out of the 150, there are maybe one third is meaningful. Some of this is scarily accurate. So I wonder how they get this, how they learned this, but uh, two third is silly. Right, so Google lists me as uh, interested in adrenaline, uh, wild adventure sports, nightclubs, alcohol, and a whole bunch more. I can uncheck, but as I said, so. But uh, knowledge bases that capture your interests could be one use case. Another one is not at the level of individuals, but at the level of social cultural groups. Like it's related to the common sense uh, knowledge theme. Um, now, common sense knowledge, the, the way I presented it, you would assume that this is universal all over the planet, but that's not the case, right? There are many things which, uh, which uh, are widely agreed upon. So they're not fully objective anyway, but they, are wide, they have high intersubjective agreement, consensus, if you wish. Uh, uh, but within certain social cultural groups, like within a certain country, but maybe even finer than that, maybe young people agree on certain things. For example, greeting people by shaking hands. It's established in the Western world, less so in the Eastern world. And among young people, even in the Western world, you rarely do this, right? So, uh, so conditioning these kinds of things, this is another interesting uh, 
situation to explore. And it could be helpful in, uh, in understanding uh, social media content, in, in, uh, in giving background information to chatbots and so on. Thank you. Uh, I saw uh, Fu Sheng uh, may have a question. Yes, thank you for, for the talk. It's a great talk. And thank you, Jen and Chui, for organizing the, the talk. And uh, I have a quick question. The, so it, it looks like actually the language model is actually very complementary to knowledge base and actually a lot of latent relationship and through the embedding can establish the distance and in this actually from unstructured world to structured kind of the relationship and especially knowledge graph have a lot of the structure and we learn a lot of the more explicit relationship. And my question is, uh, if I have a specific domain, let's say in finance, and uh, I think that the Bloomberg has been creating such, such an internal kind of the, the knowledge base and, uh, and also, the, uh, also the, through, through this actually learning. I'm just curious if, if I'm starting from scratch, I have a knowledge uh, the, the, through a language model using finance of the a language model, and I have a generic of the free base of the, the, the thing. How in your mind will be build a, a better for a domain specific of a knowledge base or knowledge graph? You have, first, you have to train it on the relevant content. So you have to be very careful. Uh, this requires like almost expert uh, knowledge in what uh, documents do you give it for training? Like GPT-3 has been criticized, for example, in, in papers, several papers that is poor on... Uh, in, in yeah, the, it's it's very coherent in the GPT-3, but, but, but they're not very domain at a specific. Yeah, yeah. They, and, and in fact, it's unfair. I was about to say this, unfair. Exactly, that's but actually if, my point. If you, want, if you want biomedical knowledge or language model for biomedicine, you need to train it over PubMed and health forums and, and things like that. So yep. First thing, the other thing is maybe you can help the, the this bootstrapping by compiling entities first and, and types of entities, classes. So I think the backbone of every knowledge base is entities organized into classes. And for most domains, there's, there are structured sources to start with. Like in, in the biomedical domain, uh, um, the, the databases about drugs, for example, there are uh, lists of, uh, of recognized official diseases, if you wish, MASH tags, um, UMLS, and so on. So I would not start from scratch. Uh, and then once you have a backbone, you, you still need to infer relationships. Um, and that is indeed conceivable with language models. I don't think you will easily reach 95% uh, uh, correctness or something like this, but it depends a lot on the downstream application, right? Some, app, not all applications of knowledge graphs need super high uh, correctness. Some are fine with so many errors as long as the, the recall is good and, and end users, depends on the end user application. Like even search engines could live with, with higher uh, error levels except that they're always being cautiously watched by the press and the, the, the public. So every error they make is an embarrassment and therefore they play it very conservatively. But search actually is always forgiving, especially you can show mixed results. You show something from the knowledge graphs, but also a few web pages through, um, that you get through other ways of evaluating queries. So yes, you have a point. But Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Given the time, uh, yeah, let's um, you know wrap up here. Uh, we want let's uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Gerard uh, Wickham again. This is a, uh, for the wonderful talk and particularly uh, in your evening. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And if, can, if there are questions uh, offline later. Feel free to send me email. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And also, this wraps up the um, 
all the seminar series this summer and uh, I hope everyone enjoy a summer and then we will continue uh, in the next in the coming fall semester. Thank you. Uh, have a nice day. Have a, a nice evening. Thank yeah. you. Take care of you all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.